touch our hearts. God, don't let us leave unchanged this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the word. Revelation chapter one, verses 12 through 20 says this, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst or the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I now, ho I now have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. What's going on, everybody? We doing all right? Things are ramping up. Man, every week it's like, I know I need to jump right in this, but there's so many things I want to address. Number one, what Duran said about me getting old or him getting old and catching up with me and feeling sore when he gets out of bed, man. He, he looks good today, right? Did you see that suit? So both of us, this is the difference between a white man and a black man. We're both, we're, we're both wearing flashy clothes today. His looks so much better than mine. Mine's just the colors of a winning football team. Maybe that's why he woke up in pain this morning. That, that could be it. That could be it. Um, in all seriousness, as we go today, today we're going to um, wrap up this series. And next week, we're starting a new series, still in the book of Revelation, but it's going to be called I Know. And I, there's so many times, whether I'm, I'm talking to you guys just personally, or even what the elders and the staff are talking about, we're just praying. We've been praying for a while that God would shift the spiritual atmosphere of Orlando North and really um, bring us to new levels. And so one of the things that we've been focusing on the last several months, and, and this is really, you, you've heard this when we did the Renew services at the beginning of the year, one of the things that we're focusing on both in our messages with my sermons, certainly that, that's gotta be a must, but we've really focused on the music with Zach and um, Laura and Manny with leading us. We, we've asked them when we pick songs, it's not just about how you're singing, which I'm so grateful for that and the media team and the band, it's the words we're singing. Let's pick songs that are doctrinally rich. And so one of the things that I've really gotten involved in the last couple of months in helping them pick songs, and they've done a phenomenal job. This team is incredible and I love them um, dearly. But one of the things that's shifted is the song selection where we're singing really rich doctrine. Now there are songs that are really great worship songs that I, I, I sing them sometimes in my car. I'll never let you hear me sing them, but there's songs that, that work in churches, but they just don't work here at Orlando North. There's song, I call them Justin Bieber songs, baby, baby, baby. Oh, and you just kind of keep repeating the same thing over and over again. But one of the things we're trying to incorporate here at Orlando North is doctrinal depth. And so that's what's going on. I know some of these songs are wordy and God bless Owen back there on Pro Presenter who has to keep up with all of these words and doing a great job. But I, I just want to let you know that since we've start, started really focusing on that, our worship has shifted. Everything's changed. And then when we're opening up the book of Revelation, um, I'm, I'm so pleased. Like some of the things you guys are talking to me about and speaking to me about, I'm hearing it through the connect groups. You guys are talking to me on your way out. It's like this book is shaping things. It's doing something in our hearts. This isn't our typical sermon series. God is really doing something. And we've prayed for this shift. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the middle of it right now. So God is doing something. So keep holding on to him. Watch what he does. Invite some friends. I'm telling you, people are gonna start coming to Jesus um, through these services. And so I I want you to invite your friends um, and make sure you're a part of this every single week. And I'm just so thrilled with what God is doing. Now, here's what we're doing today. Um, and, and thank God I've divided today into two parts. Otherwise, last week was gonna be a really, really long message. But we've divided it into two parts. Today, we are ending, we are ending. You ready for this? We're coming to the conclusion 
of the first chapter of 22, book, 22 chapters in Revelation. So we are about 4%, after today, we're about 4% of the way through um, the book. But what I wanted to do is I really wanted to focus, and I've said this a couple times, um, I wanted to focus on this first chapter because the first chapter of Revelation is the key to unlocking the other 21 chapters. So many of us have grown up with the book of Revelation and we've wanted to understand it. We've, we've implored God, let me understand this book. And it hasn't made sense. And a lot of it hasn't made sense because we haven't properly digested chapter one. Chapter one is the key or the legend. It's kind of the code cracker to the rest of the book. If you get chapter one, the rest of the book will start coming more naturally. If we skip chapter one, chapters two through 22 wouldn't make sense at all. And what we've discovered in chapter one, and this is the main message, is in that first line, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This word revelation, coming from the Greek word apocalypsis, or apocalypse is where we get this word apocalypse, doesn't mean what we've always thought it meant. Apocalypse isn't this end time thing with zombies and creatures and war and battle. Apocalypse means a breakthrough, like Lauren just says. It's a breakthrough, it's a peeling back. It's an unveiling of the stage. Pull back the curtain to see what is really there. So in the book of Revelation, what is going on is Jesus is showing his church. He's showing us, listen, things aren't as they seem. You look around your world and there's darkness and there's chaos and you swear that the devil is winning. And Jesus is here going, no, 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 take a peek. Look into what is really happening behind the scene and know that I have won, know that I am victorious. And right now the battle has already been won, but we've got to win or we got to live as though we know this to be true. Now remember this, where John is coming from. This is what we spent a lot of time on last week. So I won't spend a ton of time on it today, but where John is coming from, the, the author of this, Jesus has given John, the apostle John, this revelation. And now it's his job to put it into paper, put pen to paper so that we can have this revelation. But he's currently sitting on an, a deserted, not a deserted island, a prison island of Patmos off the coast of modern day Turkey. And he's sitting here as an exile. And he's got to be looking back on his life. And he's an old man at this point. He's probably about 90 years old. And he's looking back to the early years of his life when Jesus called him from fisherman to fisher of men. And all of a sudden his life changed. He followed Jesus. He saw the ministry of Jesus. He saw the life of Jesus. He's the only apostle that was at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. He ran to the tomb upon Jesus's resurrection. He helped establish the church in Jerusalem. He was there when Paul started his missionary journeys and, and planted the churches all over the world to the Gentile world. He's seen all of this. But now decades later, here he is exiled and his friends, his Christian friends are being murdered for their faith. And he's got to be despondent. There's got to be something in John going, man, is what I learned decades ago, is it still true? Did I mishear? Did I misunderstand? Did I hallucinate those things? Did I misremember or am I misremembering those things that happened once upon a time? And in that moment, and this is where we're at in our lives, right? When we distance ourselves from some God movements earlier in our life, maybe as a teenager or as a young adult, we walk away from it and we're like, did God really move? Was that, was that really God or was that an emotional youth camp hype thing where God didn't really do anything in my life? And the further we distance ourselves from that, the more we misremember. And in those moments where we're questioning and we're wondering, is God still present? Is God still doing stuff? What is God up to when it seems like the world is lost to the pits of hell? In that moment, Jesus shows up. He shows up to John on this island and he shows up to him in his desperation. He shows up to him in his pain and his sorrow and his struggling. And remember last week, he doesn't show up and say, hey, hey, John, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to rise up and, and raise up a resistance. I, I want you to go to battle. I, I want you to build up some politicians that will overthrow the emperor. Here's some money to build some new programs in the church. He doesn't do any of that, does he? Now, instead, what he does is he comes to Johnny and he says, Here's an apocalypse. Here's a revelation. I'm gonna pull back the curtain, John. You're despondent, you're struggling. It seems like the world is all gone to hell in a handbasket. Let me pull back the curtain so you can see what is really going on. And when he pulls back the curtain, before he gets into all the stuff in chapters two through 22, with the mark of the beast, with the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea, with the dragon that's looking to kill baby Jesus, before he gets into all of this weird stuff that we don't understand, he says this, Look at me, set your eyes, set your gaze on me. I want you to see the victorious one because when you look at me, all fear fades. Faith rises 
and fear fades. So if in your life, listen, if you're in your life right now and you're freaking out and your life is filled with anxiety and the balloon floating over our states from China doesn't help anything. And you're like, what in the world is going on with our crate? Could, could that be any more revelation driven, right? It, it just, that's weird. That should have been in the movie Thief in the Night. Like, of course there's a hot air balloon floating across our country. If you haven't seen that yet, that's weird. There's weird stuff. So all of this stuff is going on and Jesus says, look at me eyes up here. Get your eyes on me. Don't pay attention to all the distractions. And it's amazing what he does in this first chapter of Revelation. I'm kind of sad to turn the page, even though chapters two and three are awesome, because it's the letters, the seven letters to the seven churches. But man, chapter one is awesome. And in chapter one, what Jesus is revealing to John is, here's who I am. And the salutation and all of that, here's who I am. But at the end, these verses that we just read, verses 14, 12, 14 through 20, what it's talking about is, here's who I am. And we covered three, there are four things that he identifies for us as who Jesus is. He reveals to John who he is. We covered three of those last week. We only have one to cover today. This is why we split it in half. So last week you could watch football, okay? So AFC, NFC championships were on. Hope you watch those terrible games. No football today, so we can go all day long, okay? All that's on today is PGA Tour, that's it. So I I won't go there, but here's what's going on. Three things that we covered last week, one thing that we covered we're going to cover today, this morning. Last week, here's what we unpacked, just to remind you. Number one, Jesus reveals where he's located. I am standing in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. And here in verse 20, he says, what are the seven golden lampstands? Well, they're the churches. Jesus' presence, even though he's omnipresent, he's everywhere, so never mistake this. His intentional presence is in the middle of his church. So Jesus is very much present today right here. He's standing at attention for those he has given his life for his church. So that's where he's at. Then secondly, he says, this is who I am, the son of man. It was the son of man who was standing in the middle of these golden lampstands, as we discovered last week. And again, this is the stuff that we need to help each other with as we piece these puzzle puzzle pieces together in the book of Revelation. The son of man is drawing us back to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, this apocalyptic message from the Old Testament is talking about the Son of Man. And when he talks about the Son of Man, for the first century Jewish person, it's bringing up this image of one that comes in thunder and lightning and power, just like we just sang in the Revelation song. So it's this majestic, awe-inspiring, catch-your-breath God. Now, the amazing thing, the interesting thing is, as you think about the end of that first century, those third, fourth generation Christians, when they were hearing stories of Jesus, yeah, they heard that he rose from the dead, but they're also hearing that he'd had lunch with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. That he was, he was just this really great guy. And so what happens at the end of the first century, John, or Jesus is like, hey, John, in this revelation, let's show them who I am. That yeah, I'm all those things, but I am also the God of, of all heaven and earth. I am the God of the cosmos. I am huge and majestic and magnificent and brilliant and powerful. This is who I am. So he says this as the son of man. So we see that he's standing in the middle of the churches as this strong, glorious son of man. And then they show us what Jesus is wearing. And this is my favorite part of last week. Jesus is wearing a robe and a golden sash around his chest. Remember this robe and this golden sash represent the the garments of the high priest all the way back to Aaron, Moses' older brother, as he was given the high priestly garments. So he's wearing these high priestly garments and the high priest at the day was the mediator between God and man. He was the bridge builder, the connector between God and man. So this is demonstrating this is what Jesus is now. He's our bridge builder. He's our mediator. He's our advocate between God and man. It's really intentional what the scriptures show us that he's wearing this golden sash and he's not wearing it around his waist. If he was wearing this golden sash around his waist, it would say that he's still got work to do, but he's wearing this sash around his chest saying, it is finished. My work is done. I have already won the battle. The battle's not hinging on something in the future. It is over. It is finished. Now let's walk in that victory. So that's what we covered last week. Now, today it gets really, for me, it's really cool because when I did understand the book of Revelation, it was normally out of this text. How many preachers have you heard speak on this text where it says, hey, there's one space in the Bible where we get to see what Jesus physically looks like now that he's glorified in heaven? So, hey, I wonder what Jesus now looks like. Does he still have the nails in his hand? Is, what, what, what's his physical feature? What's all of this? And, and we come to this chapter, the end of this chapter, chapter one, and we get these seven distinctive marks of what appear to be Jesus's physical attributes. 
And I'm gonna let the air out of the bag a little bit. We can take this literally. We can look at it and go, yeah, Jesus had pure white hair, wool, woolly white hair and bronze skin and his hands look like this and all. We can take it like that. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. But there's no doubt, there's zero doubt as we walk through this that you can argue that this is an imagery pointing to something else. It's, it's more about who he is and what he does rather than what he looks like. So today we're gonna walk through these seven attributes and here's the amazing thing. Again, here's that number seven. Remember from the first week, anytime we run across the number seven, the number seven means fully and complete. This is completely God. This is everything that we need. So John is again, or Jesus through John is saying, hey, listen, in the turmoil, in the chaos, in the persecution, in the struggle, in the darkness, look at me, look at me. And he gives us seven attributes. So I wanna walk through these seven attributes. See, you're like, you said you had one point. Well, I have one point with seven attributes. Okay, so that's why we couldn't do it last week. So there's seven physical characteristics that were demonstrated or shown here about Jesus through this revelation. A couple of them are just gonna be real simple. We're gonna fly through and a couple we're gonna spend a little bit more time on. I do want you to notice of these seven characteristics, five of them are from the shoulders up. It's all about his face. It's about his head. It's about his hair. It's about his eyes. It's about his mouth and his voice. Five of the seven are up here. I think part of the reason is when John gets this revelation, remember what Jesus is wearing. He's wearing the high priestly garments with the robe and the sash. So the only thing exposed skin-wise is his head, his hands, and his feet, all of which he points our attention to. So he starts here with this. Okay, so it's like head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, right? But he does. He starts with the head, or more specifically, he starts with the hair. Chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 14, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow, Okay. Now, remember back to last week, one of the things we said, we talked about uniforms. We talked about when you see somebody in uniform with what they're wearing, it often identifies what they do, right? So if somebody walked in here today with dark blue outfits on, tightly tucked in, blue, bulletproof vest under their shirt, handcuffs on one side and a, a Glock 9 millimeter on the other, you're like, that's a cop, right? Remember the joke was with the millennial pastor, right? We got anybody wears skinny jeans and ripped up shirt and the shirt's way too small for them. Spiky hair, glasses with no lenses in them just to look cool. It's probably a non-denominational pastor. So we, we see this, that uniforms identify what a person does. But to the Jewish person, especially 2000 years ago, the hair signified the character of the person. So we see this in the Old Testament. We see this in the New Testament, how to wear your hair. This is the wisdom of the bald. Women cover your hair. Men wear your, not your dreads. I don't, the, the curly things that they wear in the front. Jay, help me out. I'm drawing a total blank right now. You know what I'm talking about, right? So wear your hair in a certain way. If you wear your hair in a certain way, it signifies something. It signifies your purity as a Jew. So hair signified purity. What does white hair signify? The ultimate and purity. So what God is showing is right off the bat, before I get to any other attributes, I want you to know that Jesus is pure. And this draws all the way back from the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says this, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So the top of his head, his white woolly head, simply means that he's pure. Psalm 51, 7 says this, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So the head, first of all, reveals the purity of Jesus. Now we move down from his head into his eyes. We just move a little bit down from his hair right into his eyes. Revelation 1.14 says that his eyes were like a flame of fire. Here's what this is saying. This is really interesting. Not only is Jesus pure, but he is also the one who purifies Remember, he's the great high priest. He's the mediator. He's the bridge builder between God and man. God alone, and this is awesome. This morning in my devotional time, I'm doing the Bible Project reading plan. And the video that they do this morning was on the book of Leviticus. And it's amazing. Once you read Revelation and you understand Revelation, all of a sudden these other books, even the book of Leviticus, which is the most difficult book in the, it's harder to understand sometimes than Revelation. All of a sudden, there's things in Leviticus that stand out and pop because of this. And the purity rituals that we see in Leviticus all of a sudden are shining through in the book of Revelation. So we see that Jesus isn't just pure, but his job is to purify us. He's the mediator, the bridge builder between a holy God 
and an unholy man. So he, he's over here, God's over here holy, but there's this disconnect between us and God. So Jesus, through his fiery eyes, is the one who can come over here and purify us. Throughout the scriptures, when we see fire, we see purity, okay? Over and over again, when you see the object of fire, it often means purity. Remember the burning bush in the book of Exodus. Moses approaches this bush that's on fire. As he gets closer to the bush, the bush starts talking, Bush starts talking. We find out quickly that it's the presence of God within the bush. The bush talks. God talks to Moses and says, take off your sandals. The place you are standing is holy because you are in my purified presence. And so with the fire, he's purifying Moses. We see pillar of fire at night, cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, God's holy presence. Altar fires, fiery furnace with the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this purifying fire. Finally, the fiery chariots, dun, 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 right? So there's fire throughout scripture and every time we see fire or most of the time when we see fire, it's representing purification. So fire permeates and transforms us. Holiness gets inside us and when it gets inside of us, it changes us. So Christ gaze with his eyes. It doesn't just look at us. He's not just staring at us, just watching us. He's looking into us and speaking into us to purify us. This is what's going on. So start with the purity of his hair. He is pure, but then he shares that purity with us through his refining fire. The third thing, which is really of the seven, this is my favorite, is his feet. Now I think feet are disgusting. I have nasty feet. I wear size 14 shoes. I've got mammoth feet. I, I'm not a feet guy. Feet are gross. Your feet are gross. My feet are gross. Jesus's feet, they're beautiful, okay? Because they're bronze, man. They look good. No, here's what's going on. In, in, this, in this one right here, this is where, I want to be careful here. Duran and I were talking about this a little bit. This is a passage of scripture where it'd be very easy for us to stretch the scripture and say, see, this is what Jesus looked like. Jesus, he, he's a bronze man, okay? So this was the color of his skin was bronze. Well, you know what? I could have told you that he was bronze without needing Revelation chapter one to tell me that, right? Why? Because he was a first century Palestinian Jew. And I think we that grew up, particularly people of color in here, please forgive us gringos in here. We grew up with flannel boards that had Jesus represented as a New York Jew, right? He grew up white with a Yankees hat on. This, this is what Jesus looked like to us. And then the older you get, you're like, wait a minute, time out. Jesus really did. And I, I, I don't mean this as any kind of derogatory statement. Jesus really did look more like Osama bin Laden than he did Rob Duford. Way more, way more. So I don't need Revelation chapter one to tell me that he had bronze skin. This is not what it's talking about. It's not talking about his skin being brown or black. Instead, you know what it's doing? And this is almost unarguable. It's pointing us back to Daniel again. Because in Daniel chapter two, there's this image. It's, it's incredible when we start connecting the dots of scripture. In Daniel chapter two, here's what's going on. The Israelites are oppressed. They're, they're slaves. They've been enslaved in Babylon. Okay, a whole bunch of stuff happens because of this, this Babylonian exile. And while they're in Babylon, who's the king? As a kid, if you were in church, you learned this name. You're like, that's a fun name. Even to this day, I cannot spell this name. But the king of Babylon at the time was King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? So chapter two of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar has this wild dream. And in this dream, he has this image and all of this, and he's going nuts. He's having sleepless nights because he doesn't know what in the world this dream means. So he orders all the magicians, the mystics, the wise men, to come to the palace so that they can tell him what this dream means. Now, just to fast forward a little bit into the life of Jesus, when we talk about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem in Luke chapter two, those kind of wise men were probably the ones that saw the star and traveled to see him. These are the people he's calling on. I'm calling on the ones who read the stars for a living. I'm calling the mystics. I'm calling the magicians. Come to me to explain to me the dream. They show up. They're probably pretty excited. And they're like, hey, King, King Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, Nebi, tell me, tell me. What's the dream? What's the dream? Tell me the dream so I can interpret the dream. And I love this card that Nebuchadnezzar plays. He says, no, no, no. If you're really a magician, if you're really a mystic, if you're really supernatural, you don't need me to tell you the dream. So not only do I need you to interpret the dream, I need you to tell me what the dream is first. And if you can't tell me what the dream is first and you can't correctly interpret it, you and your family, dunzo. 
that's some pressure, right? You're at least gonna take some stabs at it, right? You're gonna guess, well, you saw a cucumber and a tomato talking, right? Oh, that's veggie tales. That can't be that. So you're like, what's going on? And they're like, that's impossible, king. We can't do it. So all of his men go out to wrap up all the wise men, all these people who have been trained in the arts of mysticism and magicians and the, these super wise men. And Daniel had been lumped into that group. So they're trying to find Daniel. And Daniel's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know God. Let me have a shot at this. So Daniel travels to see King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the same Daniel that's with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is incredible Daniel. And by the way, when you read the book of Daniel, don't read it like the other Old Testament prophets. Read it more like the way you read Revelation as apocalyptic literature. These things are twin sisters, Siamese twins. And so back here in Daniel, Daniel shows up to King Nebuchadnezzar. And he's like, what's going on? Well, I've had this dream and I need you to interpret it. And, and much like Joseph in Genesis, Daniel's like, well, I don't interpret dreams, but God does. Let's see what God does. And God reveals to him, to Daniel, here's what the dream was. And the dream was really interesting, right? The dream was of a great image, a great idol that Nebuchadnezzar would make for himself of himself. And this great idol would be worshiped and this great idol had all of these specific characteristics. This is what Daniel chapter two, verse 35 says. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken into pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That doesn't make any sense to you because I went completely out of order right there. My bad. Here's what's going on. In this, he's got this image of this statue that's been erected of him and it's made of all of these materials. But the thing that we're supposed to catch today in Revelation is what the feet were made of. In this image of Nebuchadnezzar at the bottom was this mixture of iron and clay. The feet were made of iron and clay, which would give you temporary stability. But ultimately, because clay is involved in this thing, these feet, this foundation of this massive image were unstable. And then in chapter two, verse 35, we see that just one simple rock is going to come and it's going to wipe this whole thing away because his feet were made of iron and clay. Fast forward to Revelation chapter one. And all of a sudden the image is this image of God, white hair, eyes that pierce, they're on fire and feet that are made of bronze. And bronze could be a compilation of iron and copper where it's really, really strong iron and really, really pliable copper that when anything hits it, it can't take it down. What's going on here is Jesus is giving John this revelation of I'm not like Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not like Caesar. I'm not like Herod. I'm not like Emperor Domitian. All of them will fall. Every one of their images, every one of their temples, every one of their lives will fall. But my feet are stable. I am a foundation that cannot be shaken by any stone. This is who I am. So he starts, he says, I'm pure. My head, white, pure. I'm the purifier. I, pu I purify you. But I'm also strong and can be trusted. He moves fourthly to his voice. The fourth thing that we notice is his voice. Now we're gonna notice in a minute, the sixth thing is his mouth. We, there's a, distingu a, a distinction between his voice and his mouth. Verse 15 says, Jesus's voice was like the roar of many waters. So here we're not talking about what he's saying. We're talking about the tone in which he's expressing it. Parents, you know the difference between those two things, right? Right? Kids, you, know, you definitely know the difference. There's a difference between my mom coming up to me and going, oh, Robbie, and Robbie, right? Totally different thing. We were singing these songs this morning. I'm sitting there in the front row. We sang three of my favorite songs, Yet Not I, but Christ in, through, through Christ in Me, and then Hymn of Heaven and Revelation Song. Love all three of those songs. Can you imagine if we sang the song, um, Yet Not I, but Through Christ in Me, and there's this song, there's a line in that song that has become my favorite lyric of any song, and it's Jesus now and ever is my plea, okay? Think about that. I have one answer to everything in life, and it's Jesus now and ever is my plea. So this band could come up here and we could read the lyrics to those songs and they're true and they're powerful. Jesus now and ever is my plea, but it's different. It hits differently when Lauren wails that thing, right? And I'm not gonna do it because that's just embarrassing. But there's a difference when there's a tone and, and he's speaking to the tone of Jesus. What kind of tone was his voice inflecting? The voice of many roaring waters. Not a weak dripping of a fountain, not a whisper, 
but a magnificent, a magnificent, majestic, powerful. I'm strong, I'm pure, I purify. The sound of many waters, flashes of lightning, robes of thunder. This is who it is. So Jesus is bringing this revelation back that it's not just, hey, yeah, I hang out with tax collectors and sinners. Absolutely do that, but don't forget who I am. I am the son of man. I am the one who created the cosmos. I am all of this. So it's, it's giving us this majestic image of Jesus. So he's pure, his hair is white, his eyes are like fire, they purify, right? His feet are stable as bronze. His voice is roaring like many waters. Have you ever seen the ocean on, a, on our hurricane days? Like you watch the Weather Channel and you see Jim Cantura. This is the only time we ever see Jim Cantura, the Weather Channel out there. And in those moments, the waves are crashing and going nuts. So this is the power of our God. This is the power of Jesus. This is what he wants us to see in this. This is his voice. Fifth thing is his right hand. Verse 16, in his right hand, he held the seven stars. This is awesome because again, we've moved. So between the feet and the hand, these are the only two things that are not um, part of the face. And I encourage you, go back and study this stuff. There's, I don't have time to dive into each one of these things. There is so much here. But now we see in his hand, there's something specific that God wants us to see in Jesus. And it's not just any hand, it's his right hand. We see in Jesus's right hand, something is going on. What is he doing with his right hand? He is holding seven stars. Those seven stars we find out in verse 20. Um, verse 20 is the angels of the church, but in the angels of the church is the churches themselves. He's holding the churches in his hands, but there's something more powerful culturally going on at this moment. You see in the first century, remember these astrologers that studied the stars? A lot of the mysticism, a, a lot of the faith was all revolved around what they saw in the heavens. And in the heavens at the time, there were seven stars. There were seven planets. There weren't the, do we have what, eight now? Eight and a half, depends what you do with Pluto. Okay, so at that time they, they had seven stars and they looked to the stars and as the stars shifted, not understanding that our earth was rotating, but as the stars shifted, it meant things about their destiny. These stars determined their destiny. Now, the emperors were smart. The emperors were really, really smart. They might not have believed this hogwash about the stars determine everything. Some of us 2000 years later still look to our astrology charts for that kind of hogwash, okay? But here they are, they're like, wait, people believe this. People buy into this. So you know what I'm going to do as an emperor? I'm going to load my throne and load my palace with images of the planets of these stars so that people will know that I have been designated the emperor of the cosmos. I am the king of the cosmos. I am the, the Caesar of the cosmos. Kyrios Caesaris, Caesar is Lord because the stars have determined my fate. And Jesus comes along and gives John this revelation and says, here's my right hand. What's in his right hand? Those seven stars. What's contained in those seven stars? Our universe, our solar system, our planets, our planet, Rome, the emperor, the church, everything is represented in this. Now, the right hand is really interesting because with the right hand throughout the scriptures and throughout Middle Eastern culture, you find that the right hand is a significant hand because with this hand, you do stuff. It's with this hand, the carpenter yields his hammer. It's with this hand, the soldier yields the sword, right? It's with this hand that we do stuff. And so Jesus is saying, with my right hand, I do something too. I run the cosmos, Everything is, con is contained in my right hand. The shepherd yields his staff in his right hand. So the seven stars are in Jesus's right hand. Caesar does not have the stars. He does not own the stars. The, sea the stars do not run life. Jesus does. The son of man is the Lord of the cosmos, which is why Paul would then write in Colossians chapter one, verse 16. Listen to this and tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. What does that sound like? Paul echoes this in Romans eleven thirty six, 36, doesn't he? Help me. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. He holds the whole world in his hands. 
In Sunday school, as a four-year-old, I learned that song, and it might be the most important thing I've ever learned. I learned Jesus loves me, but I also learned the one that loves me holds everything in his strong right hand. So if you're freaking out today about a balloon or a kid or a financial situation or, or something going on with your body, he has you and me, sister, in his hand. He's got you and me, brother, in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hands. So we see here, he's pure, his white hair. He speaks purity with his eyes. He's firm foundation with his feet. The tone of his voice is strong and majestic. In his right hand, he holds everything. The sixth aspect of Jesus that we see is his mouth. Verse 16, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Now, if you know your scriptures at all, you know this sounds familiar. From his mouth comes a two-edged sword. This is from Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts. It discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This is different than tone. This is the power of God's word. Melanie and I, we've been walking through. It's weird. It's crazy what the Bible will do. Like, if you wonder what the pastor and pastor's wife talk about, a lot of times we're talking about a scene from Friends. That's our favorite TV show. That's it, okay? So our, our kids are a lot like Ross and Monica having dance content. And so we're like, hey, that's what we talk about. But you know what we've been talking about a lot last six months? This book. This book is blowing our minds. We have so many moments where we're just talking about it and we're like, we just can't help it. And we just start crying. It's good that the kids don't see us like this. I'm glad we're empty nesters right now because Revelation is ruining us in a great and beautiful way. The other day, she finished this book by Daryl Johnson that, that, I'm work, that I'm using as, as kind of the base for this. And we're talking about the power of Jesus's word. Do you, have you ever contemplated how powerful his word is? John focuses on this, not just in Revelation, but in his gospel. In John's gospel, remember how he begins in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning, echoing Genesis chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Later on in chapter one, he says, and the word became flesh, became Jesus and dwelt among us. This word went from just this heavenly feature, heavenly person to the son of man living and active here. But the word of God, think about this. When God created the universe in Genesis, how did he create it? Did he pull together a bunch of resources and say, hey, I, I, natural resources and say, I'm gonna pull these together, I'm gonna make this up and boom, there it is. No, there are no natural resources to be spoken of. What he did to create was he spoke. Do you have that power? I don't have that power. When, when I speak a word, I don't just, hey, I need a sandwich for lunch, bam, sandwich. Doesn't happen, that would be cool, right? I wouldn't have to get up. Or I wouldn't have to get up. Duran makes fun of me for having struggles in the, in the morning to get up. That's not my struggle. My struggle is staying asleep those seven hours during the night, not having to get up 15 times. Wouldn't it be cool if at 3 a.m. for the fourth time I'm getting up, I'm going, hey, I don't need to go to the bathroom again. I, mean, I know that's foul, but it would be cool if I could just speak that into existence. I can't do that. But with the power of God's word, he's like, I got this. What does mankind use as our tool of choice? for power and authority, for winning and victory. It's the sword or the gun. For God, it's his tongue. He just speaks and life happens. So whatever situation we're going through, whatever darkness we face, we need to understand in the power of his tongue, he can change everything. Or he has changed everything and he wants to pull back the curtain and see, allow us to see, see what I've said? See what I've done? So why would we not be in the word of God? This is our tool. This is our weapon, right? It's the only offensive weapon in the tools of the spirit that we're given. This is it, or the armor of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the words that come out of Jesus's mouth. So he's pure, he purifies, he's foundational and strong. His voice is majestic and magnificent. In his right hand, he holds everything, including you and your kids and those you love. His mouth speaks truth and it brings life. And then finally, it's his face. He ends with his face. We gotta end up here. Verse 16, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. I love this final feature. Can you imagine John trying to figure out a way to describe what he was seeing in the son of man? He's like, uh, 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 
The closest thing I can compare it to is the sun because you can't look too intensely on the sun and it's beautiful and it's majestic and it's powerful and it's strong. Imagine the sun in August in Florida at 3 p.m. That, that's his face. His faith, face is indescribable. The face of God is what Moses wanted to see on the mountain and God said, you can't handle my face. In his face is blessing. The face of God represents God's blessing. In Numbers chapter six, if you grew up in high church, you know this already. In Numbers chapter six is the great high priestly blessing that was given to Aaron and it says this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So all of this is happening. We've got, we've got his head, we've got his eyes, we've got his feet, we've got his voice, we've got his right hand, we've got his mouth, now we've got his face. And John's like, uh. We've already had a doxology from John earlier in chapter one where he's like, I'm just gonna praise him. I don't know what else to do. So now he's seen that Jesus is in the middle of the church. He's the strong son of man with thunder and lightning and power. He's the high priest that mediates between God and man. And now he's these seven things. Here's his response. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. So there, that answers the question of, is it mercy me's? I can only imagine. When I see him, what, I, what will I do? Will I stand or will I fall? You'll probably fall. But he laid his what did he lay on me? He laid his strong right hand that contains everything. And he laid it on me saying, fear not. And I read today in Leviticus, when the priest has the two goats, the scapegoat and the slaughtered goat, when he puts his hand on the scapegoat, his right hand goes on the scapegoat. Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are yet to take place. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, these are the seven stars and are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, remember last week we started with John's mental health. Like, how's he doing? Frustrated, lonely, isolated, depressed? discouraged, like what's happened to the church I put so much life into? I, I thought Jesus told Peter that he was gonna build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail. It looks like the gates of hell are, not, are prevailing. And in that moment, Jesus shows up. He says, look at me, look at me. Stop looking at circumstances, thinking that circumstances dictate what is true. Pull back the curtain to see what is true. What is true? I am, I am truth. It's interesting because Jesus's offices, and if you may have heard some of this before, but Jesus's offices that he fulfills in the New Testament, he fulfills three primary offices of prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. In the Old Testament, there were these three offices, but these three offices were all filled by individual men, right? So nobody was all three simultaneously. Nobody was more than one. Isaiah was a prophet, Jeremiah was a prophet, right? Then we had priest, right? We had Aaron as a priest. And then we had kings like King David, Solomon, Saul. We had kings. None of them were all three until Jesus. Jesus comes and he becomes all three of these things. He's prophet, priest, and king. The interesting thing about this is that he is simultaneously prophet, priest, and king, but he plays the role of each one of these things at different epochs in our history. For example, while he was walking on this earth, what was he primarily? He was prophet. Now that he's in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, what is he primarily? He's our intercessory priest. He's our advocate. When he returns someday and brings his church back to him, what will he forever be? King Jesus. When he's King Jesus, there's no more need for a prophet or a priest. We've got a king. But right now, with the curtain pulled back, what is John seeing and what does he want us to see? Jesus is acting right now as our priest. He is our great mediator. He is the great bridge builder between the one who is pure and the one who can purify. He's the one who holds everything in his hand. He sees everything, he holds everything, he cannot be shaken. His voice is loud and strong. He is cosmic and bigger than you can possibly imagine. So don't look to the circumstances of your life saying this is what's real, that ain't real. 
So this morning, here's how we wanna wrap up. I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and stand, if you will. And I wish I would have done this two weeks ago and thank God for Manny and Lauren being flexible. The secret sauce of chapter one is turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. There's a chorus that we used to sing in church in the 80s. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful grace and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So whatever you're going through this morning, wayward son, wayward daughter, health issues, financial issues, whatever, just anxiety as a whole, you know what your answer is? Jesus now and ever is my plea. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and watch the things of the earth grow strangely and oddly dim. Let's let this be our prayer this morning.